Welcome to the Disruptive Podcast by Minority Innovation Weekend. Minority Innovation Weekend is a weekend summit dedicated to aiding innovators of color launch tech-focused startups, exploring emerging technologies, and showcasing tech startups that have a founder or co-founder of color. During each episode, we will discuss innovation, tech startups, and more. Minority Innovation Weekend. One weekend, endless opportunities. Please visit www.minorityinnovationweekend.org to find out how to connect with us and to register for upcoming events. Welcome to the MIW Disruptive Podcast hosted by Jayla, Sir Walter, and Jerome. So we got a returning guest. Yes, you know this guy. He's doing many great things in the community. Uh, he's the founder and managing partner of Rare Breed Ventures. I'm talking about Mac Conwell. How are you doing, sir? What's going on, family? How's everybody doing? Doing good, doing great. good. Yeah, doing good. Excited, and thank you for having me back. Glad Welcome back. to be back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on, on episode three, you were schooling us on what it means to have a venture backable company or have an idea and things like that. That was, that was a fun episode and you know, a lot's happened since episode three. What episode is this? Ooh, (laughs) (laughs) it's, it could be twenties, could be thirties. I'll have to, I'll have to check on that. Okay. (laughs) A lot's happened. Fill us in. What's been happening since that last episode? Um, I'm pretty sure during the last episode, I was still at my job working for the state of Maryland. So since then, I've quit my job and started my own venture firm. And so I've I've spent the last, almost the last year uh, fundraising a $10 million fund, um, which has been a very unique and challenging experience. (laughs) You said quit your job. That was, I know a lot of people that have thought about doing that to start their own thing. How scary was that for you? Did you go straight into it or you have any like, you know, things that were telling you not to do it? No, I went straight into it. But then also like, this is like the 10th time I've quit my job to do something crazy. So this is just who I am. This is what I do, right? Like I've, I've I quit a good government job to start companies and you know, I've, I've quit jobs for like political reasons and such. So like quitting jobs is easy. Like I, I do that all day, every day. I ain't worried about it. Like, you know, we, we just, you just know that once you do quit your job, it's all on you, right? Like you got to go make it happen. So I just knew what the stakes were. And, you know, I'd be lying if I wouldn't say I wasn't scared. Like, you know, it didn't all happen overnight. And also like in the beginning, it wasn't happening at all. So like those first few months were kind of, kind of tough. So you quit before it was like up and running off the ground, like before there was a, you know, it was still kind of in the works, basically. Yeah, it was still in the works. I mean, I had a bit of a foundation, but the but the, the, the difficulty was like, I couldn't really move forward with it like nights and weekends because I was working for the state of Maryland and I was already doing investments. So I had to wait until I quit before I even formed the entity, anything. So it was, it was, it was nothing. <laughs> um, it was just... Me and I had a conversations with a was you know a few hundred folks who who said they might be interested and said what I was doing was cool and I was like all right let's go do this and uh, the moment I quit that's when the rubber met the road was like okay how do we go raise ten million dollars I don't know we'll figure it out <laughs> so y'all want to go into that journey with the ten million dollars <laughs> yes did you know that it was going to be ten million dollars when you started yes that was. My goal was always 10. I, I always told people, I was like, look, if you gave me 24 months, I could find a way to raise $10 million for a fund. I didn't know how it was going to happen. I didn't know what it entailed, but I figured you gave me 24 months, I could find enough people to have enough meetings. I could, I could figure it out. Um, the 10 is just the number of, it's, it's a good size first fund, right? Um, especially running the fund by myself as a solo, as a solo um, investor or solo GP or general partner, um, you know, 10 million, like the size of your fund really dictates your strategy and also dictates how much money you make, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, the, fee, the way funds work is they, they, the way you make money being an investor is off of what they call the two and 20 model. So you take 2% of the size of the fund every year as your management fees. That's what you use for operations. And then you get 20% 
of all the returns your fund creates. So we have a $10 million fund and we turn that into 30 million, I get 20% of that 30 million. Well, I yeah. technically I get 20% of everything over the original fund amount. So the first 10 million goes back to the investors. They get their money back first. And then I take 20% of everything on top of that, right? But the key sticking point there is the, 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 the 2% management fee, right? So in a $10 million fund, 2% management fee every for the, for the life of the fund for the 10 years. And the average life of a fund is typically 10 years. So you get 2% every year. It's $200,000. That's $200,000 to run the fund, all the operations. So that's like pay my salary, pay for travel, pay for some other services. And there's some other nuances in there. Like you can pay for some of that stuff directly out of the fund and not out of your management fees. But once you do that, you're taking away from the money that you can actually use to invest. So here's, here's some knowledge for folks out there. When somebody says they have a $10 million fund, that does not mean they're going to invest $10 million. Generally speaking, in a $10 million fund, that 2% over two, uh, that 2% every year for 10 years comes out to 2 million. So 2 million of the fund is already allocated to management fees, right? Mm -hmm. Then uh, most funds will use a part of the money from the fund to pay for service providers. So, you know, if you got somebody handling your back end, if you got accountants, if you got legal, all that. And so let's say that takes up another 100 to 150,000 a year, right? So if you take another 150,000 a year over 10 years, it's another 1.5. That means 3.5 million of the fund is already allocated for services. Mm -hmm. So that 10 millions that I had is now mm -hmm. down to 6.5. And 6.5 is what I'm actually going to deploy, or 6.5 to 7 is what I'm actually going to be deploying and making investments with. But I'm benchmarked against the 10 million, not the 7 million I invest, right? And so from a $10 million fund, um, having a, that, that uh, 200,000 a year management fee allows you to have, be able to pay for one person and be able to kind of manage everything else. Now, if you got a fund smaller than that, like if you got a $5 million fund, that means you got $100,000 a year to like manage. And if you're using a backend like Carta or Angels List, that's already 30 to 40 grand a year. <laughs> when you break down the numbers, it seems like it's not enough money. <laughs> Uh, so when you when you see people with small funds, it's really they're they're investing on a shoestring budget. Like people think that all VCs are rich, and, and and granted, this is why a lot of people who get into venture are already independently wealthy when they get started, mm -hmm. right? Because of all some of the stuff I'm talking about. When you got somebody like me, you know, I ain't have that. <laughs> right? So you know, those first couple months when I'm just like. Yeah, I need this to work out. This, this, you know, people looking at me sideways, like, hey, Mac, you know, you still got bills to pay. Like, yeah, yeah, no, they're coming. Just, just so, you know, somebody that's, you know, trying to get into what you're trying to get into, what, what were you doing those first couple of months to secure this and get this off the ground, get this money flowing in? Meeting everybody. And so, like, for me, it was really tough because I figured I had a network. I knew some people, I could raise some money. Man, I started talking to folks and I realized in my personal network, I knew a lot of other VCs. I knew a lot of entrepreneurs. I didn't know a lot of LPs or limited partners. Those are people who invest in funds. And so I was like, yeah, I feel like an entrepreneur again. I don't have a network. What happened? I thought, I thought we got past these days. And basically what I did was I used Twitter. So as I was becoming more engaged on Twitter, I was meeting with anybody who I saw was a VC in the space or worked in the space. I was just trying to meet with them. And so from June of 2020 to September of 2020, I had over 1,100 meetings. Wow. And from like September of 2020 to, I guess we're in August of 2021, I've had close to 5,000 meetings. Mm. All right. So like when I said I met, I met with everybody, I mean, I met with everybody. And uh, it started off as just me trying to learn. And as I was trying to learn, I don't, I've mentioned this on a few podcasts, but I, I still haven't told this to her, but I was on a call with Elizabeth Yen. It's her first time ever talking. She's a partner at Hustle Fund. Really dope fund. They do really early stage investment, very similar to what I do. And, you know, I was telling her about my fund. I was like, yeah, you know, I think I'm gonna have my minimum investment be 10K, you know, just so I can get some sort of soft circle some people. And she's like, well, I think what you're doing is interesting. Can I be in? And I was like, taking it back. I was like, oh, you could do that? She's like, well, let me talk to my team. But yeah, I can do that. And so I was like, oh, so other investors can do this. And so that just became my strategy. And I was like, I'm gonna just talk to everybody I can and see who I can get in 
as I was doing that, my profile on Twitter was also growing. So when I started soft circling money, June of last June of 2020, I had 2,500 followers, right? And I've been on Twitter since like 2010. So in the course of 10 years, I accumulated 2,500 followers, right? Cool. Uh, from June of 2020 to June of 2021, I I was up to over 40,000 followers. Wow. And so as my profile is growing on Twitter, wow. more and more people in the venture space are talking about me. Then the conversations that I started to have and the dollar amount started to change. We went from having 10K conversation to half a million, a million dollar conversations. But I got to tell you, it feels a whole lot better. <laughs> <laughs> right. But so, so what happens when an investor uh, becomes a limits of partner? Like, like what do they uh, obtain from that? Um. So basically it's, here's the easiest way I can think about, right? As a VC, I am nothing more than a glorified financial advisor, right? What you do is you give your money to a financial advisor and you let them make investments typically in public markets for you, right? They're going to move your money around the stock market and bonds and stuff to, to make you more money. I do the exact same thing. It's just that instead of investing in public market companies, I invest in private companies. That's, that's all it is. So when people give me their money, like, yo, Mac, I think you can make some really smart decisions with my money and make me make more money. Cool. And that, that is my job, right? And so as a limited partner, you're giving me a whole lot of trust. Because once you give me your money, it's kind of locked up for 10 years. Mm-hmm. And so that's a lot of trust. Of like over these next 10 years, you're going to do a better job investing my money than I could do myself. And that's also part of like the conversation I'm having with people and I'm pitching them on the fund and what we're doing. It's like, hey, this is the strategy and this is how the strategy can make money. And, you know, so far we've been doing well, but it's super early. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As far as your portfolio, um, how many companies have you invested in since, since you started the fund? You know, you're going to get the most updated numbers since we started the fund. We're currently up to 20 investments. So nice. we've, we've, we've made 20 investments since January and, um, you know, we've invested and deployed the capital uh, quicker than we originally planned, but the market's been really hot, a lot of great deals. And, you know, at the end of Q2, we had 17 companies. So we've done um, another three since then. But at that point, you know, 72% of our companies had underrepresented founder, 61% of them were outside of major tech hubs, outside of Silicon Valley, New York, and Boston. 50% 50% of them had a person of color as an executive and 40% of them had a female executive, right? So those are the kind of stuff that makes me smile when I think about our portfolio and the kind of companies we're investing in. Is that a goal with your portfolio that you're trying to reach or maintain, making sure that you're, you know, including those minorities in there? Yes and no, right? So for the fund and the fund strategy, it's not. Mm-hmm. For me personally, I'm always going to have a lens to that, but I will say, you know, we've made these investments without ever having to consider that, right? This is just all, just comes from the kind of deals that we're seeing. And so I was able to get those numbers without trying, <laughs> right? Uh, and I think that's the point. Like everybody asked me like, why don't you have a diversity mandate? Cause like, I shouldn't have to, like I should be able to invest in any and everybody, but my deal pipeline should look like any and everybody, right? And so- I, I tell, I, I'm starting to tell people we're going to be the first fund that literally invests in everybody. Nice. And those 20 companies that you've invested in, like what's the range of technology that they are providing? Uh, uh, we got a mobile game studio specifically for making uh, video games for women of color called Glow Up Games. Uh, their first game is based off of the, the HBO show Insecure. And Issa oh. Rae is an investor. Oh, wow. Wow. Like, women run that, you know. <laughs> We got, we got a next generation medical center uh, called Juno Medical based out of Harlem, New York. And like their first medical center is literally in the middle of Harlem, like in the street, with like right there with the people, right? Um, the founders of a black physician turned McKinsey consultant who specialized in medical payments before starting his own medical um, system. So uh, we got a company that allows you to buy, uh, to buy into your favorite um, Twitch streamers and, e- and uh, esports teams. Uh, so basically turning esports teams into an uh, asset class. We got a company that does recyclable shoes. We got a grocery delivery shop. 
We got uh, a company that um, is going to be a neo bank for Gen Z consumers. So, you know, the first bank that, you know, most young people will ever interact with. We got after e we got after school esports team. We got neo bank specifically for women in Latin America. We got this super dope company out of St. Louis called Rebundle. They make plant-based biodegradable braiding hair. Um, okay. <laughs> you know. <laughs> got, um, I'm, and, and like my North Star and like the reason why I started the fund is a company, uh, the company's called Deveneering Labs. The first product's called the Spundle. Um, it's, uh, it's a tumble dryer that can dry a wig or hair weave in 15 minutes with no heat. Oh yeah, right. it's going to be lit. <laughs> so like, once, once it's available i can see it now in the future <laughs> like like that that i mean we're talking about an entrepreneur who wanted this company to come to life so bad like i've known her for four years and like after she kept getting no's from everybody she became a surrogate mother to raise money mm -hmm. to start building her company right like that's that is my hero she you talk about grit you talk about you know do whatever it takes that that black woman right there is is amazing um you know, and then we got some other companies in there too. So like, you know, we, we got all kinds of companies in our portfolio and that's the point. You know, we, we'll do physical products. We'll do B2B SaaS. You know, we got a company out of Dallas, Texas called RoboApp. Makes websites load faster. If you're an e-commerce site, your website can load in under a second every time, no matter what. Mm. Like, and that's, that <laughs> gentleman is a Latin founder based in Dallas, Texas, who's been coding since he was seven. <laughs> <laughs> right he used to be the lead engineer for funimation so everybody was in the manga and anime like he got all that stuff mm -hmm. right so like we invest in all types of companies and all types of people how do you find these companies are these like did you you just doing a lot of research on the back end or how are you having these conversations with these companies you know some of them dm me some of them just email me some of them i get from other investors some of them i meet speaking at events or speaking at accelerators and i, I try to be very intentional about what events and what accelerators i speak at right like it's cool to be like the top tens and all the well-knowns but then you got to go to the off the beaten path ones you got to go to the ones that are going to do pre accelerators right got to help out folks like black girl ventures you know shelly bell shout out to shelly you know, the folks in uh, Birmingham, Alabama at Velocity, because how many VCs, you know, going to Birmingham, Alabama to talk to founders. So mm -hmm. I, I'm very intentional about looking everywhere. And, you know, we've, we've been able to see some pretty cool companies. And when it comes to raising, oh, you go ahead. Uh, I was going to ask, like, so what's like the criteria that you use in order to invest in that, you know, that this is the company that I need to invest in? It's, it's, Every deal is different, right? Every deal is unique. What I'm looking for is founders who have a really unique perspective around customer acquisition or around a legacy market that hasn't seen innovation for a long time. Like those are really like my two big things because honestly, if you can show me a company that's doing well in customer acquisition experience and retention, I can show you a company's probably got a chance to do well, right? And, and the reason I use those three pillars is because it allows me to take away my biases when I'm looking at a company, right? If you come to me like, hey, Mac, I got this really cool product. Women wear it and it sucks their bodies in and it's like better underwear and hosiery. And I'm just like, I, I don't understand anything about this. And you're telling me, well, they have them in the department stores and my average customer buys three of these a quarter and our retention is at 90%. Okay, that doesn't really matter anymore, right? Like this is just a good business. Well, that's how you become an investor that never misses out on a company like Spanx. True. Right? And so that's what I'm trying to be. I'm, I'm trying to find the best quality deals no matter what. Uh, are you still uh, recruiting uh, LPs or people to invest into your fund? Yes. So as of today, uh, we are technically at 8.8 .8 million in commitments towards our fund. We have another 1.2 million to go. So anybody who's interested in being an LP and rare breed, you must be an accredited investor. Mm -hmm. um, our minimum check size is 25K. All you gotta do is go to rarebreed.vc and there's a button you can click on to become an LP. Uh, we are raising under the 506C designation, which allows me to publicly solicit. So don't nobody try to call the SEC on me or not. <laughs> We're all above board here. So that 8.8 .8 million, it took how long to raise that? Uh, it took from 
September 1 of 2020 to August of 2021. And what's your what's your selling point when you're talking to, you know, people that are interested in investing? I know you said you you want to invest better than they can. So what are you saying to them to get them to trust you to do that for 10 years? It it it, it depends, right? Because every investor is doing it for different reasons. I would say most of my LPs, most of my sophisticated LPs, right, where this is what they do, they are investing because I take a because of my unique lens and approach to deal sourcing and my unique deal flow, right? So the, I'm seeing companies that they don't, right? Like they're not going to see a, a, a plant-based hair company. They're not going to see a wig dryer, right? Um, and so, and also like I'm, invi- I'm investing really early. A lot of my LPs who are sophisticated don't invest this early. So they're looking at me to find companies they can't find, but then have me be their, their linking point for them to make investments in those companies down the future, right? Mm-hmm. And so I'm really selling them on my ability to find amazing companies. Um, one thing that's been a boom for us is because I only care about quality of deal, we do have two companies that are what we would call off thesis. Like there are stages much later than what we normally invest in. And I always have investors ask me, how do we get into those deals? Because these are also companies that a lot of them were trying to get into. Mm. It's like, well, you know, we got in because we worked really hard because, you know, we have a brand that's growing that people really care about. And we've been able to get into some companies, you know, one of the companies we got into is a company called Main Street. If you're a startup out there, check out mainstreet.com. What they do is they help you find tax credits. So on average, they help a company find 51,000 of non-diluted capital. It's just money that the government owes you that you just haven't taken. And so they help you do that process with a 15 minute phone call, help you handle the paperwork so you don't have to do all that stuff yourself. And then they, they keep a, a small cut or whatever they find you. So they basically find you free money and keep a piece of it, right? Super crazy, super cool company. They went from like zero to close to 20 million in revenue in like under 10 months. Mm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Right, they, their second round of funding, they raised $60 million at like over $400 million valuation, right? That's when I got to meet them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I said, can, anything I can do, how can I please be a part of this? And, you know, I've had people say, well, you know, that's really expensive. You know, we say we invest super early. So we typically invest in companies at like a $10 million valuation. We're talking about a company that's over $400 million in valuation, right? <laughs> and, you know, I had somebody ask me why. And I'm like, well, one, they got there really quickly. And two, I have a mentor of mine who loves to tell the story about how somebody introduced him to a company that he thought was really cool. He liked a lot, but he thought the price was too high because they had a $600 million valuation. Mm -hmm. That company turned out to be Uber. Oh. I would have given anything to give an Uber $10 (laughs) at a $600 million valuation. Right. 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 And so when you see good quality deals, you do those deals. And um, that's resonated with a lot of my investors. So now you mentioned earlier that you need, you need to be a, an accredited investor. Yes. How does someone go about becoming that? So these are really archaic rules from the SEC, but generally speaking, a tradition to be considered an accredited investor, you had to have made 200,000 a year for two years in a row or 300,000 a year for two years in a row as a household or have over a million dollars in assets, not including your personal residence, Mm. right? Those are like the traditional ways you get classified as an accredited investor. And that's like through filing taxes and whatnot, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Recently this year, I believe in March this year, they added some new rules where if you work at an investment firm and you're somebody of knowledge, you can be deemed an accredited investor, right? Or if you've taken, I believe it's the Series 7 and the Series 66, um, these financial tests, if you pass one of those, you'd be considered a credit investor. And I believe in one of them, you don't need a sponsor for. So one of those tests, anybody can go take, they become accredited. But generally speaking, it's like, it's not a common thing. And it's mostly people who are high net worth individuals. So most of the people I'm speaking to are, you know, millionaires, 
multimillionaires and one or one or two billionaires in there, right? Right. Like those are the people we go to for money, as well as corporations and then um, specific fund to fund. So, um, you know, funds like Plexo Capital, Low Tony, and them, they were the first uh, venture, they were the first like venture fund that invested specifically in diverse fund managers. Like it's a cool thing to do today. Everybody's trying to do that today. But like Low, you know, coming out of Google Ventures was like one to pioneer that direction. And so, you know, we get to talk to folks like that, but most of them, but before a first fund, especially a small fund, you know, you go through individuals. Once you start getting bigger, then you got to go through pension funds and insurance funds, stuff like that, real institutional LPs, but we ain't there yet. Uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get there. Uh, since you started this, I mean, you were working in for kind of an institution, investment institution before uh, you started a fund. Uh, what have you learned or what what's what surprised you about the process since you made it this far along? So two things. One, like intellectually, you can know something's going to be hard and not fun. And actually, you know, I thought about raising this fund for a while. And part of it is like, I don't really want to go through that fundraising process. That sounds terrible. Yeah, it's it's even worse than I thought it was. Like I thought it was pretty bad, but no, it's it's it's, it's really terrible. <laughs> um, it's just it's a lot of meetings. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of no's. Right? You just gotta like as an entrepreneur, like fundraising sucks. But you know, if you're at a place where you should be fundraising, it'll probably take you about three months. If you're struggling, maybe six. For a venture fund, it's typically like eighteen to twenty-four months to raise a fund. <laughs> <laughs> like you just you gotta you gotta ride it out and so like that that's tough um the other thing which kind of goes to that is I consider myself to be a good investor but what I'm learning and what is and which I didn't realize was going to be as hard as it has been and maybe this is just for me but you know Lil Tony who I mentioned earlier he mentions this all the time it's one thing to be a good investor. It's another thing to be a good fund manager, right? Mm -hmm. Like finding companies, evaluating companies, negotiating, writing checks. I can do that all day, every day. Um, managing internal processes, setting up, you know, the fund, interacting with my LPs to make sure they're happy, doing the quarterly reports, you know, keeping up all the stats and everything, all the backend stuff. Eh, that's a lot. It's like having, it's like having two jobs. All right. <laughs> Right. But, you know, that's what it means to be a business owner. Right? Like if you're um, a founder of a fund, you're essentially a founder of a business. So I am back to my entrepreneurial roots doing all the things I said I was never going to do again. <laughs> <laughs> and is that 10 million? Is that the I know you're saying if it goes over that you get like a higher percentage, I believe. So 10 million must not be the final goal. So that's what I was mentioning earlier was um, the 10 million is what I'm getting from investors to make investments. But as those investments make returns and we get money back from those investments, I get everything over the initial 10 million amount. Mm -hmm. um, but no, the 10 million is the goal for fund one. But typically, as you build out a venture firm, you're going to raise a new fund every, call it two to three years. And so my, my larger goal is to build a large multi-stage venture firm based here in Baltimore, Maryland. So that means... I want to be the next NEA, the next Andreessen Horowitz, the next Sequoia. Like, you know, I'm going to have a fund that's going to have over a billion dollars under management sometime in the next 10 to 15 years. That's the goal. That's what I'm working towards. Um, there's a lot of stuff to need to happen between now and then, but uh, that's 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 what we're that's what we're going for. Yeah, it's just so like you know, you have a wealth of knowledge that you acquire, I'm sure, over the years. Like what resources or journals would you recommend somebody who wants to get into VC? Well, there's a great book that recently came out, I believe it was last year called VC in American History. And it basically just charts you through the history of venture capital, like how venture capital, like the roots of venture capital come from like the, um, the um, whale oil business and whaling business. Um, I don't remember they go through the idea of carried interest. So that 20% that we call, we call it carried. Uh, so your carried interest that actually has a roost in pirating hmm. so when the pirates would come off the ship they could keep whatever they could carry 
That's where the term <laughs> carrying interest comes from. Um, another great book to read is a book called The Business of Venture Capital. It's a bit dated at this point, but it's one of the best, it's basically a textbook on VC and how venture capital works. Um, there's, there's a famous book by Brad Feld called Venture Deals. Everybody talks about it. It helps you understand what are the terms that you can see inside of a, a term sheet or inside of a, a deal, right? So it helps you understand all the legal nuances of, of um, funding terms, but it's specific to terms, right? So like that'll help you really be, get good there. Um, and then a book everybody should read is Never Split the Difference. That's a, that's a, it was a book written by like a, a former like FBI or CIA negotiator. And just it's a book on negotiation, right? Mm -hmm. Every every founder, every VC should read that book. Um, those, those are some good places to start. Okay. Perfect. I think you're doing you're doing something great. I'm just I'm amazed. This is awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate. It. Just getting started. You know, there there's a lot more to be done and. You know, it's what's been really cool. What's been really amazing is post George Floyd's killing, the amount of Black people specifically who are getting the opportunity to start venture funds and join venture funds mm -hmm. and raising capital. And, you know, we got Squire out here about to be a unicorn. You know, they're at a $750 million valuation. I remember meeting those guys when they were first getting started and being like, there's a bunch of y'all out here. Good luck. Hey, they, 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 they lasted longer than everybody else and found their way to the top. So I'm excited for those brothers, but we're seeing a lot of black people getting, having a moment. And so I'm really excited for that. And I'm excited to just be a part of it, right? Like I'm, I'm one small part of this larger community and, you know, we all got to do our piece. Very true. Mac, what's your Twitter handle? My Twitter handle is Mac, is at Mac Conwell, M-A-C. C O N W E L L. I'm fairly active. You know, follow me. If you follow me, you'll get to meet all the other VCs who follow me and all the good stuff. Um, you know, VC Twitter is a thing. It is a real thing. <laughs> you can you can raise money on Twitter. You can find mentors. You can find co-founders. Like like VC Twitter is where it's at. But make sure you follow me and uh, and make sure you engage. Let me know. Did you know that before you started your fund that VCs were active on Twitter? Like I've had people tell me, right? But I really did. I didn't get it until I started doing it myself. I was like, "Oh, this is <laughs> this is great. This is amazing." Um, and so, yeah, I I had to like I had to I had to view it for myself. But once you get in it, this is a great resource. And I think the last question for me will be: Is there any advice that you have for others that you know want to go into something similar, or you know maybe they're in it and they're going through a rocky path or trying to get people on board with them? Any advice that you give them? First, I would tell you, it's never the right time and it's never the wrong time to chase your goals, right? So if you want to get in, yeah, it may not feel like the right time. It may feel really hard. You get a lot of no's. It may take longer than you want, but if you stay at it, you'll get there. And that's the other thing. Stay at it. Like it's going to take some time. Then it happen overnight, right? You know, I know plenty of people in this space who have to wait several months before they find a job or before they get in. And, it's, you know, this is a tough industry. Venture capital, like, there are more people who want to get into venture capital than there are jobs, right? So, so keep that in mind. And, and if you want to break into this industry, read the books I mentioned and then start building up your network. You want to build up a network of entrepreneurs and a network of VCs. One, you need to meet with as many entrepreneurs as you can because you need to build up the, the muscle of, of evaluating companies. And a lot of that take comes with time because you just need to see a lot of them. And then you want to build up your network of investors because one, you want to start building that relationship with them, getting to understand how they invest and why they invest. That way, as you meet companies, you can start sending them companies that make sense for them. And if you can do that, you can start to build up a reputation of somebody who knows a lot of good companies. And having a reputation like that will get you hired. That'll get you a job. So really, it's about doing the job before you have the job, basically. Makes sense. Makes sense. So, so one last question for me would be rare breed. So, like, how did you come up with the name of your of your uh, VC? 
So I'll give you the full story, mm-hmm. right? So I started off, um, didn't have a name. And then and this is in like 2018 when I was first talking about this. Um, I knew about, you know, growing up, my father used to tell me these stories about Black Wall Street and this little known riot that happened in Tulsa. Right. And so I was going to do something around that. So we were originally going to call it Greenwood. Mm, okay. Then Watchmen comes out with their TV show. Right. And everybody knows about Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> and it's not like that cool of a thing anymore. Right. Because it was funny because when I first started, I was talking to people and I had a few white people. I, they'd be like, Greenwood, what's that mean? And I would tell them about it. And they'd be like, oh my God, that, that's, <laughs> did that really happen? I actually had one... <laughs> I had one lady who wanted to work with me. She's like, I can't work at a fund called Greenwood. My friends would never invest in something like that. And now, uh, fast forward a year later, right? <laughs> all everybody wants to talk about. So then I was like, okay, that's not really that cool of a name anymore. Everybody's doing something around Greenwood. Right. Um, I was doing it first. <laughs> <laughs> but then I was like, all right, I, I need a new name. And for whatever reason, it's like, rare breed i just i just wrote it down i started talking to people like, it's a great name it's a great name it's like all right well, we're gonna go with that so for the first time in my life i came up with a good name for something <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> hey mac hey i appreciate you coming on the show spending some time with us thank with you my w so disrupt the podcast and it was my pleasure i had fun happy to come back for a third time make sure y'all invite me again and I hope everybody learned a little something from this one. Uh, definitely, definitely. And yeah, like Sir Walter said, definitely, it was great having you on again. We definitely have you on for a third time when your fund is now like 20, 30, 40, 50, a billion million, dollars. 50, <laughs> 50, 500 million. Right. From your lips to God's ear, my brother. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so, but once again, thank you for your time. Thank you for what you're doing for the community as well. Definitely appreciate you. Appreciate y'all. Well, y'all have a good one, everyone. All right, you too. That wraps up this episode of the Disruptive Podcast by Minority Innovation Weekend. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe. Check us out online at www.minorityinnovationweekend.org and connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn.